Hello, the audience of CTRSA 2021. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the conference and it is my honor to give this presentation titled A Framework to Optimize Implementations of Matrices. This is a joint work with Zhe Junxiang, Xiang Yongzheng, and Sha Sha Zhang. The work that is the efficient implementation of ciphers on resource constraint devices. Uh, as we know, the implementation performance can be evaluated according to the circuit size, latency, and, and so on. For SBOS, there are many tools to find its optimized implementations, uh, such as the business technology and the SAT based method and the, the tool later. We focus on linear layers this paper. For linear layer, we uh, always treat it as a binary matrix of F2 and implement the matrix with the minimal number of X or gates. Since this is MP hard, many heuristics have been proposed to find the optimized implementation of binary matrix. I will uh, introduce several heuristics later. Here, I would like to introduce the matrix of XO first. The DXO counts the number of ones in, within a binary matrix, and the GXO counts the number of operations like this. And the XXO counts the number of X, uh, operations like this. This is an example. The DSO uh, implements the matrix directly according to the expression of output bits. And the GSO stores the uh, results in register each step. And we can notice that in SXO implementation, the results will be stored in one of the operands and without introducing any register. We design a framework to find the optimized implementation of the matrices according to the um, several existing heuristics. The first one we used is PAR1, which is proposed by PAR. Uh, this method exhaustively choose two columns from the matrix and compute their end. Keep the candidates pair of columns um, whose resulting factor uh, after end operation with the maximum Hamming weight. In this example, the first two columns will be chosen and their end 1, 1, 0, 0 will be added into the last column of the matrix. And before we choose the next operations, we should XOR the 1, 1, 0, 0 with the columns we chose before and update the matrices, matrix. And repeat this procedure until the Hamming weight of each row of the matrix is 1. BP algorithm is proposed by Boyer and Peralta. They define two factors named the base and the distance. Uh, each step, they uh, exhaustively choose two elements from the base and it calculates their XOR and re-evaluates the distance factor. Mm, this method selects the candidates that minimize the sum of distance and add it into the base. But if there are multiple candidates, they choose the, choose the one that maximizes the Euclidean norm of the distance factor. Here is an example. The, we first put the uh, input of the matrix into base and then initialize the distance factor as the minimum number of X or gates needed to calculate the output bits according to the elements from the base. Since the choice of the next operations is uh, time consuming, so BP takes the uh, strategy of preemptive. It means that the XOR of two elements from the base is equal to the uh, output bits. We can directly choose these two elements as the, the operands of the next operation. Mm, the BP algorithm will end it until the distance factor becomes the zero one. The following algorithm is, is the variance of BP, so I just introduced them briefly. Uh, this method multiply two permutation matrices with, with M and thus rearrange the inputs and the outputs of the matrix M. The new matrix M prime is cost 
the same airflow gates as, as M. Uh, this method takes the uh, M prime as the inputs of, of BP and defines the improvements of the implementation. In our framework, we modify this method and take the M prime as the inputs of all the other heuristics we adopt, uh, not only BP algorithm. Tan and Perry um, proposed several improved methods according to PAR and BP. R PAR1 is the special case of PAR, PAR1, and R and BP A1 and A2 are variants of BP. Limited by time here, I don't introduce them further. The heuristics we introduced just now are based on the GXO. So I, we study the outputs of these methods and propose the several reduction rules for further reduce, reducing the implementation cost. Take the rule nine and 10 and 11, for example, suppose that this is a part of its implementation and we can find that the TW is equal to TU X, X or TV, and it can be also written as TB, X or TC. The rule nine means that if TU is only used once, we can delete it and save one X or. The rule 10 means that if TV is, is only used once, we can delete it two and save one X or gate. The rule 11 means that the, if both TU and the TV only used once, we can delete them both, and thus we can save two X or gates. Uh, based on the heuristics and the rules introduced just now, we designed the framework like this. The M is the given matrix, and we first we implement it. This is its implementation, and then we uh, pick a continuous segment from it, and the, this part can be also expressed as a binary matrix, and we can use the uh, the existing heuristics to find to implement it as the green part. And this part is equivalent to this part. And this is also a, a, an implementation of the matrix M. And we mm, apply our reduction rules to it and get the final implementation. And this final implementation is equivalent to the original one. So this goes two questions. The first one is how to implement M. And the first, the second one is how to recover M prime and implement it. First, we explain the how to recover M prime. It goes to find the real inputs of inputs and the real outputs of this matrix. Here is an example. So uh, this is a given matrix implementation. And so what we should do is to recover our matrix M prime according to the operations in the red box. Uh, the first step is to find its real outputs. The T5 and T6 uh, have never been used outside of this, of this uh, part. So T5 and T6 are not the real outputs of the M prime. Uh, the second step is to find the real inputs according to the expression of T7 and T8. We expand the expression of T T7, T5, and T6, and get the expression of T7 and T8, like this. And this is the real inputs of the M prime, and it's, it's, uh, it's our output bits. And this is the matrix we recover. Uh, embedded the, this heuristics in our framework, we can implement this, met this method to uh, compute the, uh, we can use this uh, heuristics to, comp to implement the matrix uh, randomly. And, um, and if the uh, implementation is the input of our, our framework, we can start here and go on the procedure step by step. But if the matrix is uh, the input of our framework, we can start here and implement uh, by it by one of the uh, methods we use, we embedded in our framework randomly. And this, uh, our framework provides a lot of flexibility within the self because mm, we do not fix the, uh, the method to implement the matrix each time here and here. And because uh, uh, each heuristics has its own advantages and the, 
the heuristic uh, proposed in the future can be also embedded in our framework. Uh, we apply our, our framework to various matrices. Uh, this is the percentage of the best implementation produced by various algorithms. Uh, we can find that our framework can find the better implementation than other heuristics. For the applications to uh, cipher matrices, we find an implementation with 91 XOR gates for AS missed columns. And this is the sh currently the shortest uh, implementation of AS mixed column. Okay, that's all, thank you. Hello everyone, this is improvements to RSA key generation and Chinese remainder theorem on embedded devices. I'm Mike Hamburg with Rambus Labs and this is joint work with Mike Tunstall and Qinglai Xiao. Um, so this is a sort of a grab bag paper and so it'll be a little bit of a grab bag talk. So uh, I'll first go into how to generate prime numbers for RSA keys, both previous work and our two improvements on this work. Uh, and then how to do the Chinese remainder theorem without pre-computing Q inverse mod P and then combine those for RSA with compressed private keys. So prime generation first. Uh, so uh, as I expect you know, uh, RSA keys are uh, of the form n equals p q, where p and q are random prime numbers. And this process of generating the prime numbers is why RSA key generation is slow and complicated. There are also other uses in crypto for random primes, but we're focusing on RSA here. Uh, so in some sense, generating random prime numbers is really easy. You just choose a random number and then check if it's prime using, for example, the miller rubin primality test. And then you keep doing that until you find a number that's prime. The problem with this is that miller rubin is itself a little bit slow and only a small fraction of randomly chosen large numbers are prime. Uh, so all in all, this takes sort of uh, log x to the fourth time, give or take. Uh, and um, overall, it's, it's too slow uh, to be super practical. So uh, what is instead typically done by RSA libraries is trial division, where you choose a random number and then you first check that it's not like even or a multiple of three or a multiple of any other small prime number. Uh, and then you test it with your slower primality test like Miller-Rabin. Uh, so this reduces the, the number of calls to Miller-Rabin and speeds you up, but you can do even better if you can generate a number that is not divisible by the first however many primes by construction. So then it will it will automatically pass the trial division step and you don't have to do that. Uh, or another way to say this is that it's co-prime to the product M of the first however many prime numbers. Uh, so what we wanna do is generate a random number that's co-prime to M, test if it's prime. Um, and if so, uh, we're done and if not, try again. And this will be faster than the naive method by a factor of M over phi of M, which is about 10 or 12 for RSA size numbers because this is sort of the ratio of composite numbers that you weed out using this method. Uh, of course, uh, you know, in some sense, I've just kicked the can down the road. How, how do I choose a random number that's co-prime to M? So a method suggested by Joie, Payet, and Vaudenay is to use the Chinese remainder theorem. So a, a random number that's co-prime to M, or that's not divisible by the first uh, K primes, um, is the same thing, uh, says the Chinese remainder theorem, as a, a number that's random and not zero mod all of those primes. Uh, so you just choose what X is going to be mod each of these small prime numbers QI, and then you solve the equation that X is congruent to XI mod QI uh, using the Chinese remainder theorem. So you would do this by calculating the sum of XI times theta I, where theta I is a pre-computed value that's like one mod QI and zero mod the other ones. The problem with this is um, you need like maybe a hundred of these theta I's uh, and they're kind of big. And so at least on a smart card or small embedded device, uh, you're not going to be able to afford the storage for them. But uh, in some sense, this is solving a problem that's, that's stronger than we need it to be. So we don't actually care what X is exactly mod QI. Uh, we only need it to be random and not zero. So we don't need it to be XI mod QI. It can be some multiple of XI mod QI. So uh, with that observation, we notice that you can replace theta I with M over QI, since M over QI is not divisible by QI, but it's divisible by all the other primes. 
Um, so uh, this it seems like we've improved it, this a little bit, but now you have to implement division on your tiny processor. But in fact, you can compute this expression sum of xi times m over qi iteratively, building up the value m over qi over loop iterations. Um, and so this uh, enables a, a simple and quite fast loop that allows you to calculate uh, random candidate values um, using the Chinese remainder theorem. A completely different method that we found uses quadratic residuosity. So a value u is called a quadratic non-residue if it's not equivalent to uh, the square of any number mod some prime. Um, and so you can pre-compute, again, using the Chinese remainder theorem, a single value u that's a quadratic non-residue or, or such that minus u is a quadratic non-residue mod any of these small primes. Um, and in that case, the, the expression y squared plus u for integers y is not divisible by any of these small primes. It's co-prime to m for all y. So you could imagine uh, choosing your candidate prime as just r squared plus u, where r is a random number. Now that itself doesn't work um, because while it does give you a random prime, it doesn't give you a uniformly random prime. Only a very small fraction of numbers are of this form. So you might be worried that it would have subtle security problems. Uh, however, if you take uh, a number of these and uh, multiply them together mod m, the product of two values that are co-prime to m is again co-prime to m, uh, then the more of these that you multiply together, uh, the, the closer you'll get to uniform. So we have a theorem to this effect, and we suggest that if you multiply six of them together, it's probably close enough. Um, so this gives you uh, a very fast and simple way to choose random numbers that are not divisible by any small primes. Um, and uh, while it's a little bit slower than the Chinese remainder theorem method, it's also simpler and it only uses large random numbers which uh, mitigate certain side channel attacks. So that's for how you generate uh, RSA private keys. So next up, how do you use them? Um, so this is RSA Chinese remainder theorem without Q inverse. So uh, the RSA decryption equation is well known. If you take uh, a ciphertext C, you just raise it to the D power where D is the, the secret exponent mod N. Uh, but it's much faster by a factor of about four to compute this equation separately mod P and mod Q because they're smaller and then combine them using the Chinese remainder theorem using this third equation shown on the slide. Uh, however, this equation requires that you have pre-computed the value Q inverse mod P, which is not terribly difficult to compute, but it's a little bit slow. Uh, and that means that to do this efficiently, you'll have to store Q inverse mod P as part of your private key. In order to avoid this, uh, we turn to a, batching, uh, a batched inversion method that I invented for elliptic curves some while ago. And the idea is that instead of computing c to the d, or you might call it c to the one over e, because that's what d is, uh, times q inverse uh, mod p by calculating those two terms separately, you will want to calculate them together as a batch. Um, and then uh, if you can calculate this uh, mod p and then mod q, you can combine them using this more symmetric version of the, the, R, the Chinese remainder theorem shown on, on the left here. Um, so how do you compute c to the one over e q inverse? The idea is to consider a sort of grid of the values that you can get by multiplying powers of c by powers of q, where you can easily go up and to the right just by multiplying numbers together, but it's harder to go down and to the left. However, if you calculate this value c to the e minus one q to the e, then in one expensive exponentiation, raise it to the minus d power, the p minus one minus d power, then you'll get c to the one over e minus one q inverse, which you can then multiply up to get c to the one over e q inverse. So this is only slightly slower than uh, what you would have done in the first place because it has that one expensive step. It additionally has a somewhat cheaper step of computing c to the e minus one q to the e. And this costs you maybe a few percent for uh, RSA 3072. Um, the other thing to note about this is that it, it sort of dovetails into existing side channel countermeasures for RSA, in which case uh, it's almost free. Furthermore, there are a number of generalizations in the paper. 
So finally, we can combine these two techniques to do RSA with compressed private keys. So what's compressed private keys about? So if you if you imagine the trade-off between ECC and RSA on an embedded device, well, you should be using ECC because it has a number of advantages, but one of them is that the private key is just a small random number. So it's easy to generate and easy to store. Whereas the RSA private key is a, a much larger structure and it's very slow to generate. So it's uh, harder to, for example, choose a pseudo random seed, generate the private key from seed, and then just store the seed and then regenerate it when needed because the, the regeneration process is slow. But if you consider what the components of the RSA private key are for CRT, because you want things to be reasonably fast, uh, you have P and Q and then D mod P minus one and mod Q minus one and Q inverse mod P. So this uh, using this work plus previous work can all be sort of bypassed. So for P and Q, you can choose a random seed and then run the prime generation algorithm until you find a prime number. And then you record a hint that's what iteration you found uh, the prime on. And in that case, you don't need to rerun the prime generation algorithm uh, again. You can just rerun the sampling algorithm, which is fast. It's just those you know uh, six multiplications or whatever. Um, to, to regenerate P and then to regenerate Q. For D sub P and D sub Q, uh, Joie and Payet show how to calculate this efficiently using Hensel's lemma and Arazi's lemma. And then for Q inverse mod P, we can avoid that entirely using the new RSA CRT method. So the upshot of this is that if you have an RSA 3072 private key and you want to store it on an embedded device in like fuses or something, instead of using seven and a half kilobits, you can store it in only about 160 bits. This comes with a small performance loss, but if you're in a device that's con constrained by the size of its fuse array, then uh, this could definitely be worth a trade-off. So that's all for my talk. Um, thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Mustafa Khairallah, and uh, today I will be presenting the paper on the cost of ASIC hardware crackers, a Shawan case study. This is a joint work with Anupam Chattopadhyay, Gaitan Loran, Zakaria Naj, Toma Piran, and Veseline Vlishko. So SHA-1 is a hash function that has been widely used for many years, and recently there has been several attacks against it. And in this paper, we just talk about the following research, que research questions. The first thing is, can we reduce the financial cost of such attacks that have been recently proposed against Shawan? And also, what is the difference between the cost of implementing generic attacks that work against any hash functions versus the attacks that are specific for the Shawan hash function? And finally, we address the question of what is the practicality of applying attacks against an 80-bit collision-resistant hash function in practice? So some history about SHA-1. SHA-1 was selected as a replacement to SHA-0 in 1995 after some vulnerabilities were discovered in SHA-0. SHA-1 itself was broken in 2005 by Wang et al. It was practically broken in 2017 by Stevens et al. using a GPU cluster. This was done using what is known as the identical prefix collision. Then later again in 2019, a more sophisticated attack called the chosen prefix attack was implemented by Lauren and Perrin, again using GPU clusters. And the complexity of such attacks, both attacks was about to the power 63 uh, hash function operations. So what's a hash function and what do we mean by collision resistance? Hash function is a function that takes binary input strings of any length and outputs a fixed length length tag that is related to such inputs. It's like a fingerprint. And by collision resistance, we mean that we cannot find two, two different messages that lead to the same tag. By that, we can use the tag as an identifier of the message. The SHA-1 hash function is based on what is called the merkel damgard construction, which uses a block cipher and uses the structure in the figure to, to implement the hash function. And it should be secure if the block cipher has 
block size of n, then the collision resistance should be n over two, two to the n over two. The merkel damgard construction can be attacked by differential cryptanalysis. If we have uh, like a prefix, like a certain number of block cipher calls, we can introduce a difference. And then after some blocks, we can cancel the difference again. Ideally, the complexity of such attacks should be higher than the collision resistance. But in case of Shawan, this is not true. A more sophisticated attack is the chosen prefix attack where it works in a similar way, but instead of having zero different blocks at the beginning, we have completely different blocks in each branch of the collision. And then we use the differential crypt analysis to make such messages collide at the end. One way to find collisions is that we represent the hash function using functional graphs so where like each input leads to an output vertex and we search for collisions in such graphs. And there are efficient algorithms to find these collisions with the collision resistance complexity two to the n over two, but with very low memory and other requirements required. The differential cryptanalysis of sha works in a different way. In SHA-1, we have an internal state A and message M, and the message is 512 bits, but it consists of like 16 32-bit words, and we can control the difference in such words such that we can lead to zero differences in the internal state. And what happens is we find two messages and we partially find the solution that satisfies a certain differential path that is computer generated. And after we do that, we have to probabilistically satisfy the rest of the bits. And we see the bits that are dotted are bits that are unconstrained. And in these bits that are free to choose, there are some, there is something called neutral bits. These neutral bits have a high probability that by changing them, the solution is not affected. So we can brute force over these neutral bits until we find the valid solution. And basically it's like searching in a tree. So we keep changing some of the neutral bits according to certain conditions. And if they work, we go on and search, change more neutral bits and so on. So the goal is to compare the cost of building a sha attack cluster using ASIC and GBU according to the following three attack scenarios. Generic 128-bit collision, generic 160-bit collision, and implementing the chosen prefix attack that was already implemented on GPU. To do that, we designed two hardware circuits. The first one applies the neutral bit search algorithm that I briefly mentioned, where we have two SHA-1 cores, and then we upload a base solution, and we upload some conditions about the neutral bits, and then we have an enumerator that search through the neutral bits and compares whether it satisfies certain differential path or not and reports the result. And after that, the computer will handle the rest and find the collision. The other circuit that we present is a birthday collision circuit where we start with a random point in the functional graph of SHA-1 and then we search for a certain condition in the graph and this leads to a trace in the graph, and then this trace is uploaded to the computer, and the computer analyzes the trace and finds the collision. Once we have these two cores, we'll call them NP and BD, we build a chip from them like by having many cores and having a SPI interface and the control unit, and then this chip is connected to an FPGA or a Raspberry Pi, which connects through ethernet to a computer and we have many such chips working in parallel. We design uh, these circuits using hardware design and we implemented the chip up to layout using the cadence design flow. 
and we have analyzed the area and performance of the chip and the power consumption using simulations. So what are the results that we got? Here, we look at the cost for the three attacks. What we're doing is that we're run, we are assuming that we are running a cluster of such machines over three years. And when that happens, we estimate the cost of one attack. So for example, maybe the attack takes one month and we run it for three years. So we divide the overall cost by 36 or the number of months in three years. So when we have a 128 bit collision, basically we're taking SHA-1, which outputs 160 bits and we're truncated the output to 128 bits. Using ASIC, the cost can be between almost $1,000 and $8,000. And for GBU, we have two cases. First, we can rent GBUs, which was actually done in practice, or we can buy a GPU, like a lot of GPUs and build our own cluster. And the cost is between $43,000 and $61,000. For the differential cryptanalysis collision, the cost for ASIC is between 1.6K and 32K, depending on the speed of the attack and how many attacks we want over three years. Renting the GBUs is the same, 43K, while buying GBU is 26K. For the full generic collision on SHA-1, 160 bits, the cost for ASIC is 51 million, the cost for renting GBU is 4 billion, and for buying GBUs is 2.5 billion. Now we see that the cost for the low complexity attacks, attacks that are dominated by two to the power 64 complexity GBUs and ASIC are not that far off. For the generic attack, ASIC is cheaper than GBU, but for the differential cryptanalysis, the GPU is cheaper. While when we go to like higher complexity, two to the 80, which is related to the 160 bit collision, ASIC is much more competitive. Now, this is the cost of building the overall machine, which doesn't include the running cost, such as the energy consumption. And we estimate the energy consumption in the paper and it's included in the previous cost, but the estimation is based only on the chip energy consumption. So we're aware that some details are missing. But we have seen that the energy consumption, while it's a significant value, it's dominated by the manufacturing cost still. So we just provide estimations, but the results show that using $11 million, we can basically build an ASIC cluster that can break 160-bit hash functions. But this means that even if SHA-1 was not broken that by differential cryptanalysis, it can still be broken by a high budget cluster. So these are the answers to the questions we presented. Can the financial cost for the current attacks against SHA-1 be reduced? The answer is yes, but only when you have a big initial investment at the beginning, because to build such ASIC clusters, you need a big initial cost and then the amortized cost will be lower. Now, we also show that Implementing a generic 128-bit collision is cheaper than implementing a 128-bit collision using uh, differential cryptanalysis. While both attacks have similar complexity, the generic attack in practice is cheaper. We also show that an entity with maybe a billion dollar budget in the near future can break 80-bit collision resistance with a generic attack in a month or less. That's it for me today. Thanks for watching, and I'm happy to take questions in the conference. Thanks.